Have you ever been in a situation asking yourself, how am I gonna get through this? Well, that is exactly what I was thinking when I was 26 years old. I was brand new to teaching. I never worked with kids before and I'm sitting in a circle with 15 very fidgety, very opinionated seven-year-olds who seem to constantly have to go to the bathroom and I am wondering to myself, how am I gonna get through this afternoon? I had no idea how to lead this class yet. And so in my inexperience, I asked them, so what do you all want to do today? And the answer that I got was a resounding unison of childhood resistance. Nothing! Okay, I have worked with some of the most accomplished leaders out there from Fortune 500 companies to CEOs and executives in some of the fastest growing disruptive companies out there. And this group of seven-year-olds is still to this day one of the most challenging that I've worked with. I mean, I'm telling them, we got to do something. And they're arguing with me like a legal team that doesn't make any sense. And one of them just keeps saying, no, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. And then a couple of them start doing somersaults. And then one of them just starts walking away. So I say, all right, okay, all right, we are going to do nothing, but somebody show me how to do nothing. And immediately, the most fidgety of the bunch jumps into the circle and lies flat on the ground, completely still. And I look at him, and I say, is that doing nothing? Yes! The class, again, in unison. That's not doing nothing. I say, you're lying down on the ground. I wanted you to show me how to do nothing. He looks a little flustered, and he sits up, cross-legged, completely still. Well, now you're sitting cross-legged. I want you to show me nothing. So then another student jumps in, and another student jumps in, and eventually, one girl who's standing on one foot, after I've pointed out that she's standing on one foot, says, nothing is impossible. That's true, I said. Nothing is impossible. And then all the kids started cheering. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And then I said, well, if nothing is impossible, then does that mean that anything is possible? And they got really quiet. And they thought about it. And then one of them said, yes. And we spent the rest of that afternoon talking about what they wanted to do when they grew up. And even though we got there in a roundabout way, it was easy for them to believe that nothing was impossible in their lives. It's almost like there's this boundless sense of possibility that's there innate in us when we're young. And some people say, well, that's just youthful optimism. And some people say, it's youthful naivete. But is it? I only worked in classrooms for a few years, but since then, my career has focused on what brings out the best in people. And my company, Blue Case, does this in organizations, helping companies grow, helping leaders develop so that the people that work there thrive. And I believe that nothing is impossible, and it's this exact same spirit that our leaders need to address and solve some of our world's greatest challenges, even when, and especially when, things seem hopeless. Now, those of you who work with young people, you have a very difficult job, but it's imperative. You are developing our future leaders. And in the work that I do, I have seen that there are two fundamental leadership skills that I believe our future leaders in any profession, in any field, will need to navigate the uncertainty that our society is facing. These two skills are the building blocks of collaboration, and I want to bring them to you so that you can bring them into your classrooms, to your principal's office, to your boards, to your administrators, and maybe even to your families. These are the two skills. The first skill is to create a vision of what you want, even in the face of adversity. And the second skill is to listen to understand 
especially when you disagree with what someone says. Now, these two skills may sound easier said than done, but they do get easier when you practice them. So here's the first skill, creating a vision of what you want. Maybe you'll agree with me. If you believe you can achieve something, you just might achieve that. But if you believe that you can't, you won't. This is the power of our beliefs. When you have an optimistic belief, it's more likely to produce the desired outcome. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you think shapes how you act, which shape your results. There's a couple of famous studies done about this in classrooms where teachers were unknowingly told that certain groups of kids in the class were high achievers and certain kids were low performers, even though there was no actual measured difference between the two groups. Ethics of this experiment aside, you can guess what happened. At the end of that year, tests showed that those students who the teachers believed were high performing excelled in the class. And those students who the teachers believed were low performing fell behind. The outcomes of that classroom were shaped by the teacher's beliefs. And I'm sure every one of you has had the experience of believing in a student more than they believe in themselves and have experienced the power of this belief firsthand. Well, that is what the great leaders that I've worked with do too. They shape the future by holding a vision and expectation of a better outcome, even when others don't. And this skill is not complicated to do. All it takes is answering one question clearly. And that question is, even though things are the way they are right now, what is the outcome? What is the ideal outcome that you want? And it means believing that nothing is impossible. When 2020 came around and COVID hit, I was working at the time as a coach with a CEO whose entire business was focused on the hospitality industry. He calls me on a Tuesday morning and he is obviously terrified. Overnight, his company just lost all of its funding. Imagine for a moment the difficulty and pressure that a CEO whose business is in the hospitality industry would be facing when we are just beginning a global lockdown. This was a very tense moment. He says to me, my team is losing hope. It seems impossible. That was a very difficult day for everyone. It was a very difficult conversation for us, but on that call, we worked through the negativity bias, and I asked him not what he was going to do, but even though things are the way they are right now, what is the outcome that you want ideally? And he thinks about it and he says, well, I'm still committed to the mission of my company. I want to learn new ways to attract new clients very quickly. I want to secure new investors and I want more funding than we had before. And I want to make sure that the people who work for my company feel cared for and safe at this time. So he has this vision, he goes back and he shares it with his team. They all get into action together, reaching out to as many stakeholders as they can, asking them the question, what do you see is possible for us now? And they listened and they learned their way forward. And in a few weeks, they had completely shifted their product strategy to a whole new industry sector. They had secured new investors with more funding than they'd had before. And they're still thriving today. Now, what seemed impossible happened because first and foremost, he had a vision of what he wanted and he could share it with his team. This is the power of creating a vision that you want. So why aren't we all doing it all the time? Well, maybe you're familiar with something called the negativity bias. This is this hardwired tendency in us to focus more on what we don't like and what we don't want than what we like. It's a biological adaptation so that we can stay alive. It keeps us from being in dangerous situations in the future. And it does protect us. But at the same time, 
It limits us. It's the teacher who thinks they can't make a difference anymore with this new generation. It's the little girl who thinks she'll never be good at math, or the student who thinks he'll never be good at anything. It is that voice in my head when I was driving here to this talk that was saying, you are going to forget everything that you wanted to say, so you might as well just turn back around and drive home. Does anyone else sometimes have a voice like that? It is universal. But here's what I find especially interesting. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison conducted a study where they showed participants two pictures at random. The first picture they showed was an emotionally neutral picture, and the other picture was of a gruesome event. Naturally, when participants saw the gruesome event, their physiological responses were higher. But then they did a second round. Only this time, they showed a cue before showing each of the pictures. Before showing the emotionally neutral picture, they showed an O. And before showing the gruesome picture, they showed an X. And sometimes, they showed a question mark, meaning you don't know what's coming next. And guess what? 75% of participants overestimated the frequency that that gruesome picture was going to occur, and their MRIs showed that when they were looking at the question mark, their brains and their bodies were responding to the question mark as if they were looking at the gruesome image. Our uncertainty cues our negativity bias. And so here we are, our young people growing up in a world where our society is facing more uncertainty than we have probably ever seen. It's like a big question mark in the sky cueing our anxiety and our anger and our focus on worst-case scenarios. And the rate of anxiety in young people has doubled in the last 10 years. Maybe you're seeing it in your classrooms. Maybe you're experiencing that anxiety, too. And the psychology of that anxiety is not lost on attention-grabbing headline news in an industry that regularly purports that what bleeds, leads. It's as if we've become accustomed to hearing a message of the future that is filled with doom and hopelessness, and that sense that nothing in, is impossible is dimming. Now, certainly, there are terrible things happening in the world and in people's lives. That's true. But the negativity bias is a cognitive distortion of reality. It's not reality itself. No matter how difficult things seem, we don't know the future. And in order for us to accomplish what we set out to accomplish, it is up to us to each create a vision of what we want versus what we don't want. And our young people need to learn these skill, this skill as soon as possible so they can create the world they want to live in and they can create the lives they want to live, even in the circumstances that they face now. That's why the first skill is to create a vision of what you want, even in the face of adversity. But no vision can be accomplished without being able to work with others, especially when we become so divided and things are changing so fast. And that's why the second skill is to listen to understand. At my company, we help executive teams dissolve their conflicts, get aligned, and create extraordinary results. And one of the toughest situations that I have worked in was when I was working with two partners of a financial firm. And I walk into their door on a Wednesday afternoon, and it is like there is a cloud of dispute in the air, even though they're not saying anything. You all know what that's like? Yeah? They, one of them comes over to me and he puts his arm around my shoulder and says, Justin, thanks for coming, but we've decided to end our partnership today. We're no longer going to work together. Now, I was not there to work on this conflict, but that's exactly what we did. And I sat down with them, and for an hour, I listened to them go back and forth to each other, telling each other why they were wrong, and they were getting louder, and I was getting louder, and then finally, I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Neither of you can speak until the other one, until you have successfully repeated back what the other one was saying and why you think it's important to them. And they looked at me with their arms crossed like they did not like me in that moment. <laughs> but a half an hour later, they were shaking hands, ready to sign a new partnership agreement. 
Now that was hard work that those partners did, but it was good work because listening to understand is the only way to dissolve conflicts. It's the only way. Without understanding each other, the conflicts in our schools, in our classrooms, in our workplaces, in our businesses, in our families, and in our world will not go away. I've seen it again and again. When you really listen to understand someone, you will learn a new way of seeing things, and it is this learning that allows you to build collaboration where there had been only conflict. Maybe you have a conflict in your life. Maybe it's with a student or with a colleague or maybe with an uncle who votes in a way you don't prefer. So the next time you're, you're talking to them, try this out. Instead of jumping into arguing, let them know what you heard and understood them to say. And here are three prompts to make sure you can do that well. What you're saying is, what I think you mean is, did I get that right? And then you let them clarify, and, and that's it. That's the second skill, listening to understand. And these two skills are the building blocks of collaboration. I invite you educators to bring these back into your classrooms. Watch this TED Talk with your students. Talk about how you can practice these skills on a day-to-day -day basis. Ask them what their ideas are for how to practice. They'll have great ideas for you. Nothing is impossible. I see a world where every student, just like learning reading and math, learns how to challenge their own negativity biases and dream up possibilities of a better world well into adulthood. I see a world where every student is heard and understood by the teachers and peers and adults in their life. I see a world where schools are places of peace and safety because our students are learning how to listen to understand each other and navigate their conflicts from a young age. Nothing is impossible. Help make this vision real. Imagine what would be possible for your classrooms. What would be possible for the little girl who has never been heard? What would be possible for the undergrad who feels like he's not good enough for anything or anyone? What would be possible for them? And what would be possible for you? Humbly, I invite you to continue to create visions of what you want in your classes, in your schools, and in our world. Continue to listen to understand each other so you can work better together to achieve these visions. And especially, the next time you're in a situation like I was in that classroom where you're asking yourself, how am I gonna get through this? Remember what those first graders saw so easily. Nothing is impossible. Thank you.